May I please the tribunal? The tribunal would uh, turn to part three uh, of their document book. in which are included the documents relating to the earlier discussions between the German and Polish government on the question of Danzig. Those discussions, the tribunal will remember, started almost immediately after the Munich crisis in September 1938 and uh, started in the first place as cautious and friendly discussions until <coughs> the remainder of Czechoslovakia had finally been seized in March of the following year. I would refer the tribunal uh, to uh, the first document in that part uh, TC 73, uh, number 44. That is a document taken from the official Polish white book, which uh, I put in as exhibit GB 27. It uh, gives uh, an account of a luncheon which took place at the Grand Hotel Birches Garden on the 25th of October, uh, where uh, Ribbentrop saw Monsieur Lipsky, the Polish ambassador to Germany. In a conversation on the 24th of October, not I'm told that I was reading rather unnecessarily slowly Yesterday, I'm sure the interpreters will <coughs> stop me if I now go too fast. In a conversation on the 24th of October, over a luncheon at the Grand Hotel Birches Garden, at which Monsieur Huel was present, Monsieur von Ribbentrop uh, put forward a proposal for a general settlement of issues between Poland and Germany. This included the reunion of Danzig with the Reich while Poland would be assured the retention of railway and economic facilities there. Poland would agree to the building of an extraterritorial motor road and, the railway, and a railway line across Pomoche. In exchange, Ribbentrop mentioned the possibility of an extension of the Polish-German agreement by 25 years and a guarantee of Polish-German frontiers. I don't think I need... Colonel Griffith uh, Jones, the light did flash for a moment then. Yes. I don't think I uh, need read uh, the following lines. I go to the last but one paragraph. Uh, finally, I said, that's Mr. Lipsky, that I wish to warn Ribbentrop that I could see no possibility of an agreement involving the reunion of the free city with the Reich. I concluded by promising to communicate the substance of this conversation to you. But I would uh, emphasize... I would emphasize the submission of the prosecution as to this part of the case and that is that the whole question of Danzig was as, indeed, as Hitler said himself, no question at all. Danzig was raised simply as an excuse, a so-called justification, not for the seizure of Danzig, but for the invasion and seizure of the whole of Poland. And we see it starting now. And uh, as we progress with the story, it will become ever more apparent that that is what the Nazi government were really aiming at, only providing themselves with some kind of crisis which would justify or afford some kind of justification 
for walking into the rest of Poland. I turn to the next document, <coughs> which uh, uh, contains, uh, it's again uh, uh, a document taken from the Polish White Book, TC 73, number 45, which will be uh, GB 27. Uh, is it? No, I want it to be a document. A GB 28, I beg your pardon. Uh, TC 73 will be the Polish white book, which I shall put in uh, eventually. This is 28. Uh, that uh, document sets out the uh, instructions that Mr. Beck, the Polish foreign minister, gave to Mr. Lipsky uh, to hand uh, to the German government in reply to... Uh, the suggestions put forward by Ribbentrop at Birch's Garden uh, on the 24th of October. Uh, I need not read the first page. Uh, the history of Polish-German relationship is set out and uh, the needs uh, of Poland in respect of Danzig are emphasized. I turn to the second page of that exhibit to paragraph six. In the circumstances, in the understanding of the Polish government, the Danzig question is governed by two factors, the right of the German population of the city and the surrounding villages to freedom of life and development, and the fact that in all matters appertaining to the free city, as a port, it is connected with Poland. Apart from the national character of the majority of the population, everything in Danzig is definitely bound up with Poland. It then sets out the guarantees to Poland under the existing statute, and I pass to paragraph seven. Taking all the foregoing factors into consideration and desiring to achieve the stabilization of relations by way of a friendly understanding with the government of the German Reich, the Polish government proposes the replacement of the League of Nations guarantee and its prerogatives by a bilateral Polish-German agreement. This agreement should guarantee the existence of the free city of Danzig so as to assure freedom of national and cultural life to its German majority and also should guarantee all Polish rights. Notwithstanding the complications involved in such a system, the Polish government must state that any other solution, and in particular any attempt to incorporate the free city into the Reich, must inevitably lead to a conflict. <coughs> this would not only take the form of local difficulties, but also would suspend all possibility of Polish-German understanding in all its aspects. And then finally in paragraph eight, in face of the weight and cogency of these questions, I am ready to have final conversations personally with the gov governing circles of the Reich. I deem it necessary, however, that you should first present the principles to which we adhere so that my eventual contact should not end in a breakdown, which would, which would be dangerous for the future. <coughs> um, Lord, the uh, first stage in those negotiations had been entirely successful from the German point of view. They had put forward a proposal, uh, the return of the city of Danzig to the Reich, which uh, they might well have known would have been unacceptable. Uh, it was unacceptable, uh, and the Polish government have warned the uh, Nazi government that it would be. They have offered to enter into negotiations, but they have not agreed, which is ex exactly what the German government had hoped. They have not agreed to the return of Danzig to the right. The first stage in producing the crisis has been accomplished. While uh, 
or shortly afterwards, within a week or so, of uh, that taking place after the Polish government had offered to enter into discussions with the German government, we find uh, another top secret order issued by the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, signed by the defendant Keitel. It goes to the uh, OKH, OKM, and OKW. And it is uh, headed the first supplement to uh, the instruction uh, dated the 21st of October 1938. The Führer has ordered, apart from the three contingencies, was Danzig exploiting a politically favorable situation, not a war against Poland. We remembered, of course, that at the moment, uh, the uh, remainder of Czechoslovakia had not been seized, and therefore they were not immediately ready to go to war with Poland. That uh, document does show how the German government uh, answered the proposal to enter into discussions. That is C-137 and will become GB-33. GB-23? 33. 33. Yes. Yes. Uh, on the 5th of January, uh, 1939, uh, Mr. Beck uh, had a conversation with Hitler. Uh, it's unnecessary to read the first part of that document, which is the next in the tribunal's book, TC 73, number 48, which will become Uh, this will become a GB 34. Uh, in the first uh, part of that uh, conversation of which that document is an account, uh, Hitler offers to answer any questions. He says he has always followed the policy laid down by the 1934 agreement. He discusses the Danzig question and uh, emphasizes that the, in the German view, it must sooner or later return to Germany. Uh, I quote the last but one paragraph on that page. <laughs> Mr. Beck replied that the Danzig question was a very difficult problem. He added that in the Chancellor's suggestion, he did not see any equivalent for Poland. Uh, he added that in the Chancellor's suggestion, he did not see any equivalent for Poland, and that the whole Polish opinion, and not only people thinking politically, but the widest spheres of Polish society were particularly sensitive on this matter. In answer to this, the Chancellor stated that to solve this problem, it would be necessary to try to find something quite new, some new form for which he used the term Körperschaft, which on the one hand would safeguard the interests of the German population and on the other the Polish interests. In addition, the Chancellor declared the minister could be quite at ease. There would be no fait accompli in Danzig, and nothing would be done to render difficult the situation of the Polish government. The tribunal will remember that only the last document uh, we looked at on the 24th of November, orders had already been received or issued uh, 
for preparations to be made for the occupation of Danzig by surprise. Here he is assuring the uh, Polish foreign minister that there is to be no fait accompli and he can be quite at his ease. I turn to the next uh, document, uh, TC 73, number 49, which will become GB 35. Uh, a conversation between uh, Mr. Beck and Ribbentrop on the day after the one to which I have just referred between Beck and Hitler. Mr. Beck asked uh, Ribbentrop... Colonel Griffith Jones, did you draw attention to the fact that that last conversation took place in the presence of the defendant Ribbentrop? I'm very much obliged to your lordship. No, I, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, as I say, on the next day, the 6th of January, the date in actual fact does not appear on the uh, copy of I have got in my book. It does appear in the white book itself. Mr. Beck asked Ribbentrop to inform the Chancellor that whereas previously, after all his conversations and contacts with German state, statesmen, he had been feeling optimistic, today, for the first time, he was in pessimistic mood, particularly in regard to the Danzig question. As it had been raised by the Chancellor, he saw no possibility whatever of agreement. I emphasize this last paragraph. Uh, in answer, Ribbentrop once more emphasized that Germany was not seeking any violent solution. The basis of their policy towards Poland was still a desire for the further building up of friendly relations. It was necessary to seek such a method of clearing away the difficulties as would respect the rights and interests of the parties concerned. Uh, the defendant Ribbentrop apparently was not satisfied uh, with uh, that, that one expression of good faith. On the uh, 25th of the same month, January 1939, some fortnight, three weeks later, he was in Warsaw and uh, uh, made another speech uh, of which uh, the, an extract uh, is set out in PS 2530, which will become uh, GB 36. In accordance with the resolute will of the German national leader, the continual progress and consolidation of friendly relations between Germany and Poland, based upon the existing agreement between us, constitute an essential element in German foreign policy. The political foresight and the principles worthy of true statesmanship which induced both sides to take the momentous decision of 1934, <laughs> provide a guarantee that all other problems arising in the course of the future evolution of events will also be solved in the same spirit, with due regard to the respect and understanding of the rightful interests of both sides. Thus, Poland and Germany can look forward to the future with full confidence in the solid basis of their mutual relations. And even so, uh, the uh, Nazi government must have been still anxious that the Poles were beginning to sit up, as your Lordship will remember the expression used in the note to the Führer, sit up and take uh, or assume that they were to be the next in turn because on the 30th of January 
Hitler again spoke in the Reichstag, 30th of January, 1939, and gave further assurances of their good faith. Uh, that document, that extract, was read by the Attorney General in his address, and therefore I only put it in now as an exhibit. That is TC 73, number 57, which will become GB 37. That uh, then brings us up to uh, the uh, March 1939, the seizure of the remainder of Czechoslovakia and the setting up of the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. <coughs> if the tribunal would now pass to the next part, part four of that document book, uh, I had intended uh, to refer to three documents where Hitler and Jodl were setting out the advantages gained through the uh, seizure of the remainder of Czechoslovakia. But uh, the tribunal will remember that Mr. Alderman, in his closing remarks yesterday morning, dealt very fully with that matter, showing what advantages they did gain by that seizure, and showing on the chart that he had on the wall the immense strengthening of the German position against Poland. And therefore, I leave that matter. The documents are already in, in evidence, and uh, they, uh, if the tribunal uh, should wish to refer to them, they are found in their correct order in the story in their document book. As soon as uh, that uh, Occupation had been completed. Within a week of uh, marching in to the rest of Czechoslovakia, the heat was beginning to be turned on against Poland. If the tribunal would pass to uh, document TC 73, which is um, about halfway through their document book, it follows on after Yodel's lecture, which is a long document, TC 73, number 61. It's headed official documents concerning Polish-German relations. Did it come after TC 72? It comes after uh, L172. Page 1397, I'm told it is. Uh, yes, it, uh, that, that, that is correct. It doesn't actually represent the page number, but that is at the bottom of the page. Got it, Jeff. I'm sorry these are not numbered. Oh, I've got it now, have you got it? I've got it now. Uh, this uh, will be GB 38. <coughs> GB On the 21st of March, Mr. Beck again uh, saw Ribbentrop. And uh, the nature of the conversation was generally very much sharper than that that had been uh, uh, held uh, a little time back at the Grand Hotel Berchtesgaden. I saw Mr. Ribbentrop today. He began by saying he had asked me to call in order to discuss Polish-German relations in their entirety. <coughs> he complained about our press and the Warsaw students' demonstrations during Count Ciano's visit. 
I think I can go uh, straight on uh, to uh, the paragraph, the larger paragraph, which commences further, Mr. Ribbentrop. Further, Ribbentrop referred to the conversation at Birch's Garden between you and the Chancellor, in which uh, Hitler put forward the idea of guaranteeing Poland's frontiers in exchange for a motor road and the incorporation of Danzig into the Reich. He said that there had been further conversations between you and him in Warsaw. That is t between, of course, uh, Mr. Beck. Uh, he said that there had been further con conversations between you and him in Warsaw on the subject and that you had pointed out the great difficulties in the way of accepting these suggestions. He gave me to understand that all this had made an unfavorable impression on the Chancellor, since so far he had received no positive reaction whatever on our part, I beg your pardon, he had received no positive reaction whatever on our part to his suggestion. A Ribbentrop had had a talk with the Chancellor only yesterday. He stated that the <coughs> Chancellor was still in favour of good relations with Poland and had expressed a desire to have a thorough conversation with you on the subject of our mutual relations. A Ribbentrop indicated that he was under the impression... I think it's unnecessary that I should read uh, the next page. Uh, briefly, Ribbentrop... Uh, emphasizes the German argument as to why Danzig should return to the Reich. And I turn to uh, the first paragraph on the following page. I stated, that's Mr. Lipsky, I stated that now, during the settlement of the Czechoslovakian question, there was no understanding whatever between us. The Czech issue was already hard enough for the Polish public to swallow, for despite our disputes over the Czechs... With the Czechs. I beg your pardon. Well, with the Czechs, they were, after all, a Slav people. But in regard to Slovakia, the position, position was far worse. I emphasized our community of race, language, and religion and mentioned the help we had given in their achievement of independence. I pointed out our long frontier with Slovakia. I indicated that the Polish man in the street could not understand why the Reich had assumed the protection of Slovakia, that protection being directed against Poland. I said emphatically that this question was a serious blow to our relations. A Ribbentrop reflected for a moment and then answered that this could be discussed. I promised to refer to you the suggestion of a conversation between you and the Chancellor. Ribbentrop remarked that I might go to Warsaw during the next few days to talk the matter over. He advised me that the talk should not be delayed, lest the Chancellor should come to the conclusion that Poland was rejecting all his offers. Finally, I asked whether he could tell me anything about his conversation with the Foreign Minister of Lithuania. Uh, Ribbentrop answered vaguely that he had seen Mr. Erbsis on the latter's return from Rome and that they had discussed the memo question which called for a solution. Uh, that conversation took place on the 21st of March. It wasn't very long uh, before uh, the world knew what the solution to Memel was. On the next day, German armed forces marched in. <coughs> if the uh, tribunal would turn over, I think the next document is unnecessary, and turn over to TC 72, number 17, which becomes GB 
as a result of uh, these events, uh, not unnaturally, considerable anxiety uh, was growing both in the uh, government of Great Britain and the Polish government. And the two governments, therefore, had been undertaking conversations between each other. On the 31st of March, the uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Chamberlain, uh, spoke in the House of Commons. Uh, and uh, he assured, or, or he uh, explained, that as a result of the conversations that had been taking place between the British and Polish governments, uh, I quote from uh, the uh, last but one paragraph of his uh, statement, as the House is aware, certain consultations are now proceeding with other governments in order to make perfectly clear the position of His Majesty's government in the meantime, before those consultations are concluded, I now have to inform the House that during that period in which the Polish... Uh, during that period, in the event of any action which clearly threatened Polish independence and which the Polish government accordingly considered it vital to resist with their national forces, His Majesty's government would feel themselves bound at once to lend the Polish government all support in their power. They have given the Polish government an assurance to this effect. I may add that the French government have authorized me to make it plain that they stand in the same position in this matter as do His Majesty's government. On the uh, 6th of April, a week later, uh, a formal communique was issued by the Anglo-Polish uh, governments, uh, which uh, repeated the assurance the Prime Minister had given a week before, and uh, in which Poland assured Great Britain of her support uh, should uh, she, Great Britain, be attacked. Uh, I needn't read it all. In fact, I needn't read any of it. I put it in. It's TC 72, number 18. I put it in as GB 40. <laughs> The uh, anxiety and concern <coughs> that the uh, governments of Poland and Great Britain were feeling at that time appears to have been well justified. Uh, during the same week, on the 3rd of April, uh, the tribunal will see in the next document an order signed by Keitel. It emanates from the High Command of the Armed Forces, stated Berlin, 3rd of April, 1939. Its subject is the Directive for the Armed Forces, 1939-1940. Directive for the Uniform Preparation of War by the armed forces for 1939-1940 is being reissued. Part one, frontier defense, and part three, Danzig, will be issued in the middle of April. Their basic principles remain unchanged. Part two, fall vice. Uh, which is the code name for the operation against Poland, part two for vice is attached herewith. The signature of the Führer will be appended later. The uh, Führer has added the following directives to fall vice. One, preparations must be made in such a way that the operation can be carried out at any time from the 1st of September 1939 onwards. 
This is in April, the beginning of April. The High Command of the Armed Forces has been directed to draw up a precise timetable for Fall Vice and to arrange by conferences the synchronized timings between the three branches of the Armed Forces. The plans of the branches of the Armed Forces and the details for the timetable must be submitted to the OKW by the 1st of May. Uh, that document uh, went, uh, as uh, the tribunal will see on the following page, under the heading distribution, to the OKH, OKM, OKW. Are those words at the top part of the document, or are they just notes? No, they are part of the document. What, directives from Hitler and Keitel, preparing uh, for war? Well, I beg your pardon. No, I beg your pardon. They are not. Uh, the document uh, starts from under the words translation of a document signed by Keitel. Yes, I see. Uh, the first words being top secret. <coughs> uh, if the tribunal will look at the uh, second page uh, following on after distribution, uh, it will be seen that there follows a translation of another document, uh, dated the 11th of April. <coughs> uh, and that document is signed by Hitler. I shall lay down in a later directive the future tasks of the armed forces and the preparations to be made in accordance with these for the conduct of the war. No question about war, conduct of the war. Until that directive comes into force, the armed forces must be pre prepared for the following eventualities. One, uh, safeguarding the frontiers of the German Reich and protection against surprise air attacks. Two, uh, fall vice. Three, the annexation of Danzig. Then Annex 4 contains regulations for the exercise of military authority in East Prussia in the event of a warlike development. That again, that document goes to the OKH, OKM, OKW. Uh, on the next page of the uh, copy tribunal have translation uh, annex one is set out which is the safeguarding of the frontiers of the german reich and uh, i would quote from uh, paragraph two in uh, brackets under special orders legal basis it should be anticipated that a state of defense or a state of war, as defined in the Reich Defense Law of the 4th of September 1938, will not be declared. All measures and demands necessary for carrying out a mobilization are to be based on the laws valid in peacetime. Well, Lord, I, that document is 100 and, uh, C120. Uh, it becomes GB41. It contains some other uh, later documents to which I shall refer uh, back in their chronological order. As a, or, or rather the uh, statement of the Prime Ministers in the House of Commons 
uh, followed by the Anglo-Polish communique of the 6th of April, was seized upon by the Nazi government to uh, urge on, as it were, the crisis which they were developing uh, in Danzig between themselves and the Poles. And uh, on the 28th of April, the uh, German government issued a memorandum in which they alleged that the uh, Anglo-Polish uh, declaration was uh, incompatible uh, with uh, the 1934 agreement between Poland and Germany and that a res as a result uh, of entering into a, or by reason of entering into that agreement, Poland had uh, unilaterally uh, renounced the 1934 agreement. I would only quote uh, three short passages or four short passages from that document. Uh, the German government have taken note of the Polish-British Did you give us the reference to it? I beg your pardon. Uh, it's TC 72, number 14. It becomes GB 42. TC 72, number 14. Some of these passages are worth quoting, if only to show the complete dishonesty uh, of the whole document on the face of it. The German government has taken note of the Polish-British declaration regarding the progress and aims of the negotiations recently conducted between Poland and Great Britain. According to this declaration, there has been concluded between the Polish government in the event of the independence of one of the two states being directly or indirectly threatened. Thereafter, the document sets out in the next three paragraphs the history uh, of German friendship towards Poland. I quote from the last paragraph, paragraph five on that page. The agreement which has now been concluded by the Polish government with the British government is in such obvious contradiction to these solemn declarations of a few months ago that the German government can take note only with surprise and astonishment of such a violent reversal of Polish policy. <coughs> Irrespective of the manner in which its final formulation may be determined by both parties, the new Polish-British agreement is intended as a regular pact of alliance, which by reason of its general sense and of the present state of political relations is directed exclusively against Germany. From the obligation now accepted by the Polish government, it appears that Poland intends, in certain circumstances, to take an active part in any possible German-British conflict in the event of aggression against Germany, even should this conflict not affect Poland and her interests. This is a direct and open blow against the renunciation of all use of force contained in the 1934 Declaration. I think I can omit paragraph six. Paragraph seven, Polish government, however, by their recent decision, recent decision to accede to an alliance directed against Germany have given it to be understood that they prefer a promise of help by a third power to the direct guarantee of peace by the German government. In view of this, the German government are obliged to conclude that the Polish government do not at present attach any importance to seeking a solution of German-Polish problems by means of direct friendly discussions 
with the German government. The Polish government has thus abandoned the path traced out in 1934 for the shaping of German-Polish relations. All this would sound very well if it hadn't been for the fact that orders for the invasion of Poland had already been issued and the armed forces had, all, had been told to draw up a precise timetable. I pass, I think, uh, uh, the document goes on to uh, set out the uh, history of uh, the uh, last uh, negotiations and discussions, sets out uh, the demands of the 21st, which the German government had made, the return of Danzig, the autobahn and the railway, and the promise by Germany of a 25 years guarantee. And uh, I go down to the last but one paragraph on page three of the exhibit, under the heading one in brackets. <coughs> the Polish government did not avail themselves of the opportunity offered to them by the German government for a just settlement of the Danzig question for the final safeguarding of Poland's frontiers with the Reich, and thereby for a permanent strengthening of the friendly, neighborly relations between the two countries. The Polish government even rejected German proposals made with this object. At the same time, the Polish government accepted, with regard to another state, political obligations which are not compatible either with the spirit, the meaning, or the text of the German-Polish Declaration of the 26th of January, 1934. <coughs> Thereby, the Polish government arbitrarily and unilaterally rendered this declaration null and void. And in the last paragraph, the German government uh, say that nevertheless, uh, they are prepared to uh, uh, continue friendly relations uh, with Poland. On the uh, same day as uh, that memorandum was issued, uh, Hitler made a speech in the Reichstag, 28th of April, in which he uh, repeated, in effect, the terms of the memorandum. Uh, this is document TC 72, number 13, which becomes GB 43. Uh, I would uh, only refer the tribunal uh, to the latter part of the second page uh, of the translation. He has again uh, repeated the demands and offers that Germany made in March, and he goes on to say that the Polish government have rejected his off offer. And lastly, I have regretted greatly that this incomprehensible attitude of the Polish government, I beg your pardon, I have regretted greatly this incomprehensible attitude of the Polish government, but that alone is not the decisive fact. The worst is that now Poland, like Czechoslovakia a year ago, believes, that the, believes under the pressure of a lying international campaign that it must call up troops although Germany, on her part, has not called up a single man and had not thought of proceeding in any way against Poland. As I have said, this is in itself very regrettable, and posterity will one day decide whether it, is, uh, whether it was really right to refuse this suggestion made this once by me. This, as I have said, was an endeavor on my part to solve a question which intimately affects the German people by a truly unique compromise and to solve it to the advantage of both parties, both countries. According to my conviction, Poland was not 
not a giving party in this solution at all, but only a receiving party, because it should be beyond all doubt that Danzig will never become Polish. The intention to attack on the part of Germany, which was merely invented by the international press, led, as you know, to the so-called guarantee offer and to an obligation on the part of the Polish government for mutual assistance. It's unnecessary, my lord, to read more of that. Uh, it shows, as I say, how completely dishonest uh, everything that the German government was saying at that time. Here was Hitler, probably with a copy of the orders for Vol Vol Vice in his pocket as he spoke, saying that the intention to attack by Germany was an invention of the international press. In answer to uh, that memorandum and that speech, uh, the Polish government issued a memorandum on the 28th of April. Uh, it is set out in the uh, next uh, exhibit, TC 72, number 16, which becomes TB 44. Uh, it's unnecessary to read more than... Uh, it's dated the 5th of May, not the 28th of April. It's in answer to... I beg your pardon, yes. It's in answer to it, on the 5th of May. Uh, it's unnecessary to read more than the uh, two short paragraphs from uh, uh, that reply. Uh, I can summarize the document in a word. It sets out the uh, objects of the 1934 agreement to renounce the use of force and to carry on friendly relationship between the two countries, to solve difficulties by arbitration and other friendly means. The Polish government appreciate that there are difficulties about Danzig and have long been ready to carry out discussion They uh, set out again their part of the recent discussions. And I turn to the second page of the document, the one but last paragraph. Or perhaps I should go back a little uh, to the top of that page first half of that page, the Polish government uh, alleged that they wrote, as indeed they did, to the German government on the 26th of March, giving their point of view that they then proposed joint guarantee uh, by the Polish and German government of the Danzig, of the city of Danzig, based on uh, the principles of freedom for the local population in international affairs. They say that they were prepared to examine the possibilities of a motor road and railway facilities and that they received no reply to those proposals. It is clear that the negotiations in which one state formulates demands and the other is to be obliged to accept those demands unaltered are not negotiations in the spirit of the Declaration of 1934 and are incompatible with the vital interests and dignity of Poland. Which, of course, in a word, summarizes the whole position from the Polish point of view. And uh, thereafter, they uh, reject the German accusation that the Anglo-Polish agreement is uh, incompatible with the 1934 German-Polish agreement. They state that 
Germany herself has entered into similar agreements with other nations. And lastly, on the next page, uh, they too say that they are still willing to entertain a new pact with Germany, should Germany wish to do so. If the tribunal would turn back uh, to uh, the exhibit C120, to the first two letters of which I referred only a few minutes ago, it became GB41. bottom of the page there is a figure 614 for the first page of that exhibit it was the directive from Hitler and Keitel preparing for the war and invasion of Poland I <coughs> it is a, a letter from the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces. It's signed by Hitler. It's dated the 10th of May. It goes to the OKH, OKM, OKW, various branches, rather, of the OKW. And uh, uh, with it, apparently, were enclosed instructions for the economic war and the protection of our own economy. I only mention it uh, now to show the, that uh, throughout this time, preparations for the immediate aggression were continuing. The, that document will still be part of the same exhibit. And again, on the next page, which is headed, uh, the number is C120L. Is set out a pressy, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, it is a pressy only and not a full translation. And therefore, perhaps uh, I won't read it, but it, uh, it is the annex showing the directives for the war against the enemy economy and measures of protection for our own economy. As we will see later, not only were the military preparations being carried out throughout these months, these weeks, but economic and every other kind of preparation was being made for war at the earliest moment. And I think this uh, period of uh, uh, preparation up to, uh, which I've taken up to May 1939, uh, finishes really with that famous meeting or conference in the Reich Chancellery on the 23rd of May, about which the tribunal has already heard uh, it was uh, L79, it is now already US 27, and it was referred to, I think, or has been known as the Schmunt Minutes. Uh, it is the last document which is uh, in the tribunal's document book of this part. And I do not propose to read anything of it. It has been read already, and the tribunal will remember that it was the speech in which uh, Hitler was 
crying out for Lebensraum. <coughs> he said that Danzig was not the dispute at all. This is a question of expanding their living space in the east. Where he said that uh, the decision had been taken to attack Poland. Can you remind me of the date of it? The, twen the 20th, uh, uh, 3rd of May, 1939. Mm. And your Lordship will remember that Goering, Rader, and Keitel, amongst many others, uh, were present. Perhaps one particular, one, three lines uh, are worth reminding the tribunal of when he said, if there were an alliance of France, England, and Russia against Germany, Italy, and Japan, I would be constrained to attack England and France with a few annihilating blows. Fuhrer doubts the possibility of a peaceful settlement with England. So that not only has the decision been taken definitely to attack Poland, but uh, almost equally definitely to attack England and France also. <coughs> well, I pass to the uh, next period. Uh, which I've described as the final preparations uh, taken from June up to the beginning of the war at the uh, beginning of September. Part five of the tribunal's document book. And uh, the tribunal will glance at the index to the document book For convenience, I have divided the evidence up under four subheadings. Final preparations of the armed forces, economic preparation, the uh, famous Ober-Salzburg speeches, and the political or diplomatic preparations <coughs> urging on the crisis and the justification for the invasion of Poland. I refer the tribunal to the uh, first document in the, that book dealing with the final preparations of the armed forces uh, it again is a, an exhibit containing various documents and uh, I refer particularly to the second uh, document uh, dated the 22nd of June 1939. Uh, this is a document C126 which will become GB45. It will be remembered that a precise timetable had been called for. <coughs> uh, now, uh, here it is. The Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces has submitted to the Führer and Supreme Commander a preliminary timetable for fall vice. Based on the particulars so far available from the Navy, Army and Air Force. Details concerning the days preceding the attack and the start of the attack are not included in this timetable. The uh, Führer and Supreme Commander is in the main in agreement, with the, in agreement with the intentions of the Navy, Army and Air Force and made the following comments on individual points. One, in order not to disquiet the population by calling up reserves, on a larger scale than usual for the manoeuvre scheduled for 1939, 
as is intended, civilian establishments, employers, or other private persons who make inquiries should be told that men are being called up for the autumn manoeuvres and for the exercise units it is intended to form for those manoeuvres. It is requested that directions to this effect be issued to subordinate establishments. All this is, uh, becomes uh, uh, relevant, uh, particularly relevant, uh, later when we find uh, the German government making allegations of mobilization on the part of the Poles. Here we have it in May, or rather June. Uh, they are mobilizing, only doing so secretly. For reasons of security, the clearing of hospitals in the area of the frontier, which the Supreme Command of the Army proposed should take place from the middle of July, must not be carried out. Uh, the tribunal turn to the top of the following page. It will be seen that that order is signed by the defendant Keitel. I think it's unnecessary to uh, read any further of that document. Uh, there is perhaps, we'll save turning back, uh, if I might take it rather out of date now, the first document on that front page of that exhibit is a letter, a short letter, dated the 2nd of August. Uh, attached, it's only an extract, I'm afraid, that it appears in the translation. <coughs> attached to operational directions for the employment of U-boats, which are to be sent out to the Atlantic by way of precaution in the event of the intention to carry out for vice remaining unchanged. FOU Boats is handing in his operation orders by 12th of August. One uh, must assume that the defendant Donit uh, knew uh, that his U boats were to uh, go out into the Atlantic by way of precaution in the event of the intention to carry out full vice remaining unchanged. I turn to uh, the next document in the tribunal's book. C30, which becomes GB 46. That is a letter dated the 27th of July. It contains orders for the air and sea forces for the occupation of the German free city of Danzig. The uh, Führer and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces has ordered the reunion of the German Free State of Danzig with the Greater German Reich. The Armed Forces must occupy Danzig Free State immediately in order to protect the German population. There will be no hostile intention on the part of Poland so long as the occupation takes place without force of arms then sets out how the occupation is to be affected. All this again becomes more relevant when we discuss the diplomatic action of the last few days before the war, when Germany was purporting <coughs> to make specious offers uh, for the settlement of the question by peaceful means. It's quite clear from these this evidence that the decision had been taken and nothing was going to move him from that decision. 
that document, as set out, uh, says that uh, there is to be no, uh, that there will be no hostile intention on the part of Poland so long as the occupation takes place without the force of arms. Nevertheless, uh, that wasn't the only condition upon which the occupation was to take place. And uh, we find that during July, uh, right up to the time of the war, <coughs> steps were being taken to arm the uh, population of Danzig and to prepare them to take part in the coming occupation. I refer the tribunal to the next document, TC 71, which becomes GB 47, uh, where there are set out <coughs> a few only of the reports which were coming back almost daily during this period from uh, Mr. Shepherd, the Consul General uh, in Danzig, to the uh, British Foreign Minister. The uh, sum total of those reports can be found in the <coughs> British Blue Book. The walls surrounding the shipyards bear placards. Comrades, keep your mouths shut, lest you regret the consequence. The master of the British steamer High Commissioner Wood, whilst he was roving Konigsberg from the 28th of June to the 30th of June, observed considerable military activity, including extensive shipment of camouflage covered lorries and similar material by small coasting vessels. On the 28th of June, four medium-sized steamers loaded with troops, lorries, field kitchens, etc., left Konigsberg ostensibly returning to Hamburg after maneuvers, but actually proceeding to Stetty. Names of steamers, and so on. Uh, and, and again, uh, as another example, the one that is called number 11 on the next page. Uh, you're going too far. Uh, I, I repeat that. As another example, uh, the uh, report number 11 on the next page of the exhibit. The same is dated the 10th of July. The same informant, whom I believe to be reliable, advises me that on the 8th of July, he personally saw about 30 military lorries with East Prussian license numbers, where numerous field kitchens had been, uh, I beg your pardon, on the uh, Bischofsburg, where numerous field kitchens had been placed along the hedges. There were also eight large anti-aircraft guns in position, which he estimated as being over three-inch caliber, and three six-barreled light anti-aircraft machine guns. There were about 500 men drilling with rifles, and the whole place is extensively fortified with barbed wire. I don't think it's necessary to occupy the tribunal's time with reading more. Uh, those, as I say, are two reports only of a number of others that can be found in the uh, British Blue Book, which sets out the uh, arming and preparation of the free city of Danzig. On the uh, uh, 12th of uh, August and the 13th of August, when uh, preparations were practically complete, and it will be remembered that they had to be complete for an invasion of Poland on the 1st of September, uh, we find uh, Hitler and uh, the defendant Ribbentrop at last disclosing uh, their intentions to uh, their allies, the Italians. Uh, one of the passages uh, in Hitler's speech on the 23rd of May, uh, it will be remembered, I, it was not quoted now because the document has been read before, but in uh, a passage in that speech, Hitler 
in regard to his proposed attack on Poland had said, our object must be kept secret even from the Italians and the Japanese. Uh, now, when his uh, preparations are complete, uh, he discloses his intentions to his Italian comrades and uh, does so in the hope that they will join, join him. Uh, the uh, minutes of that meeting are long and it is not proposed to read more than uh, a few passages. The uh, meeting can be summarized generally by saying that, as I have, that Hitler is trying to persuade the Italians to come into the war with him. Uh, the Italians, or Ciano, uh, is most surprised. He had no idea, as he says, of the urgency of the matter. Uh, and uh, they're not prepared. And he, therefore, is trying to dissuade uh, Hitler from starting off so soon until the Duce can have had a little more time to pre prepare himself. Uh, the value, perhaps the greatest value of the uh, minute of that meeting, is that it shows quite clearly the uh, German intention to attack England and France, ultimately, anyway, if not uh, at the same time as Poland. I refer uh, then uh, to the, the tribunal to the second page of the exhibit. <laughs> Uh, Hitler is trying to show the strength of Germany, the certainty of winning the war, and therefore the uh, hopes to uh, persuade the Italians to come in. At sea, England had for the moment no immediate reinforcements in prospect. I quote from the top of the second page. Some time would elapse before any of the ships now under construction could be taken into service. As far as the land army was concerned, after the introduction of conscription, 60,000 men had been called to the colours. I quote this passage particularly to show the intention to attack England. We have been concentrating rather on Poland. Here, his thoughts are turned entirely towards England. If England kept the necessary troops in her own country, she could send to France at the most two infantry divisions and one armoured division. For the rest, she could supply a few bomber squadrons, but hardly any fighters, since at the outbreak of war, the German air force would at once attack England and English fighters would be urgently needed for the defence of their own country. With regard to the position of France, Führer said that in the event of a general war, after the destruction of Poland, which would not take long, Germany would be in a position to assemble hundreds of divisions along the West Wall, and France would then be compelled to concentrate all her available forces from the colonies, from the Italian frontier, and elsewhere on her own Maginot line for the life and death struggle which would then ensue. The Führer also thought that the French would find it no easier to overrun the Italian fortifications than to overrun the West Wall. Yet Count Ciano showed signs of extreme doubt, doubts which, perhaps in view of subsequent performances, were well justified. The Polish army was most uneven in quality. Together with a few parade divisions, there were large numbers of troops of less value. Poland was very weak in anti-tank and anti-aircraft defence, and at the moment neither France nor England could help her in this respect. This, is, this tribunal, of course, will appreciate, is the Poland which formed such a threat to Germany on Germany's eastern frontier. If, however, Poland were given assistance by the Western powers over a long period, she could obtain these weapons 
and German superiority would thereby be dim diminished. In contrast to the fanatics of Warsaw and Krakow, the population of their areas was different. Furthermore, it was necessary to consider the position of the Polish state. Out of 34 million inhabitants, one and a half million were German, about four million were Jews, and nine million Ukrainians. So the genuine Poles were much less in number than the total population. And as already said, their striking power was not to be valued highly. In these circumstances, Poland could be struck to the ground by Germany in the shortest time. Since the Poles, through their whole attitude, had made it clear that in any case, in the event of a conflict, they would stand by the side of the enemies of Germany and Italy, a quick liquidation at the present moment could only be of advantage for the unavoidable conflict with the Western democracies. If a hostile Poland remained on Germany's eastern frontier, not only would the 11 East Prussian divisions be tied down, but also further contingents would be kept in Pomerania and Silesia. This would not be necessary in the event of a previous liquidation. I pass on, the argument goes on on those lines. I pass on to the next page. <coughs> At the top of the page, Coming back to the Danzig question, the Führer said that it was impossible for him to go back now. He had made an agreement with Italy for the withdrawal of Germans from South Tyrol, but uh, for this reason, he must take the greatest care to avoid giving the impression that this Tyrolese withdrawal could be taken as a precedent for other areas. Furthermore, he had justified the withdrawal by pointing to a general southeasterly and northeast uh, direction of a German policy. The east and northeast, that is to say the Baltic countries, had been Germany's undisputed sphere of influence since time immemorial. Are you quoting now? Oh yes, I've got it here. The, uh, the uh, east and northeast, that is to say the Baltic countries, had been Germany's undisputed sphere of influence since time immemorial as the Mediterranean had been the appropriate sphere for Italy. For economic reasons also, Germany needed the foodstuffs and timber from these eastern regions. There we get the, the truth of this matter, not the persecution of German minorities on the Polish frontiers, but the economic reasons, the need for the foodstuffs and timber from Poland. In the case of Danzig, German interests were not only material, although the city had the greatest harbour in the Baltic. Danzig was a Nuremberg of the North, an ancient German city, awaking sentimental feelings for every German, and the Führer was bound to take account of this psychological element in public opinion. To make a comparison with Italy, Count Ciano should suppose that Trieste was in Yugoslav hands and that a large minority were being treated brutally on Yugoslav soil. It would be difficult to assume that Italy would long remain quiet over anything of this kind. Count Ciano, in replying to the Führer's statement, first expressed the great surprise on the Italian side over the completely, uh, unex the completely unexpected seriousness of the position. Neither in the conversations in Milan, nor in those which took place during his Berlin visit, had there been any signs from the German side that the position with regard to Poland was so serious. On the contrary, Ribbentrop had said that in his opinion, the Danzig question could be settled in the course of time. On these grounds, the Duce, in view of his conviction that a conflict with the Western powers was unavoidable, had assumed that he should make his preparations for this event. He had made plans for a period of two or three years. If immediate conflict were unavoidable, the Duce, as he had told Ciano, would certainly stand on the German side. But for various reasons, he would welcome the postponement 
of a general conflict until a later time. No question of welcoming the cancellation of a general conflict. The only concern, the only concern of anybody, is as to time. Ciano then showed, with the aid of a map, the position of Italy in the event of a general war. <coughs> Italy believed that a conflict with Poland would not be limited to their country, but would develop into a general European war. Thereafter, uh, during the meeting, Ciano goes on to uh, try to dissuade Hitler from any immediate action. Uh, I quote uh, two lines from his argument at the top of page five of the exhibit. For these reasons, uh, the Duce insisted that the Axis powers should make a gesture which would reassure people of the peaceful intentions of Italy and Germany. And then uh, we get the uh, Führer's answer to those arguments halfway down page five. The Führer answered that for a solution of the Polish problem, and no time should be lost. The longer one waited until the autumn, the more difficult would military operations in Eastern Europe become, and Germany would not be able to do anything about it since they obviously could not bombard or destroy the place. They couldn't uh, possibly bombard or destroy any place where they happened to be Germans living. Warsaw, Rotterdam, England, London. I wonder if any sentiments of that kind were held in consideration in regard to those places. <coughs> Ciano asked how soon, according to the Führer's view, the Danzig question must be settled. The Führer answered that this settlement must be made one way or another by the end of August. To the question of Ciano's what solution the Führer proposed, Hitler answered that, the Pol that Poland must give up political control of Danzig, but that Polish economic interests would obviously be reserved and that Polish general behavior must contribute to a general lessening of the tension. He doubted whether Poland was ready to accept this solution, since up to the present, the German proposals had been refused. Führer had made this proposal personally to Beck, at his visit to Ober Salzburg. They were extremely favorable to Poland. In return for the political surrender of Danzig, <coughs> under a complete guarantee of Polish interests, and the establishment of a connection between East Prussia and the Reich, Germany would have given a frontier guarantee, a 25 years pact of friendship, and the participation of Poland in influence over Slovakia. Beck had received the proposal with the remark that he was willing to examine it. The plain refusal of it came only as a result of English intervention. The general Polish aims could be seen clearly from the press. They wanted the whole of East Prussia. Even, uh, and even proposed to advance to Berlin. That's something quite new. The uh, meeting was held over that night and uh, continued on the following day. And uh, on page seven, in the middle of the page, it will be seen uh, the Führer had therefore come to two definite conclusions. One, in the event of any further provocation, he would immediately attack, and two, if Poland did not clearly and plainly state her political intention, she must be forced to do so. Uh, I go to the last line on that page. As matters now stand, Germany and Italy would simply not exist further in the world through lack of space. Not only was there no more space, but existing space was completely blockaded by its present possessors. 
They sat like misers with their heaps of gold and deluded themselves about their riches. The Western democracies were dominated by the desire to rule the world and would not regard Germany and Italy as their class. This psychological element of contempt was perhaps the worst thing about the whole business. It could only be settled by life and death business. I beg your pardon. It could, yes, no, that's right. It could only be settled by life and death business. It could only be settled by life and death struggle, which the two Axis partners, partners could meet more easily because their interests did not clash on any point. The Mediterranean was obviously the most ancient domain for which Italy had a claim to predominance. The Duce himself had summed up the position to him in the words that Italy was already the dominant power in the Mediterranean. On the other hand, the Führer said that Germany must take the old German road eastwards and that this road was also desirable for economic reasons and that Italy had geographical and historical claims to permanency in the Mediterranean. Bismarck had recognized it and had said as much in his well-known letter to Mancini. <coughs> the interests of Germany and Italy went in quite different directions and there never could be a conflict between them. Ribbentrop added that if the two problems mentioned in yesterday's conversations were settled, Italy and Germany would have their backs free for work against the West. The Führer said that Poland must be struck down so that for 50 years, there appears to have been a query in the uh, translation, for so many years, the longer she would be incapable of fighting. In such a case, matters in the West could be settled. Ciano thanked the Führer for his extremely clear explanation of the situation. He had on his side nothing to add and would give the Duce full details. He asked for more definite information on one point in order, to, uh, in order that the Duce might have all the facts before him. The Duce might indeed have to make no decision uh, because the uh, Führer believed that the conflict with Poland could be localized on the basis of long experience. He, Ciano, quite saw that, uh, that so far the Führer had always been right in his judgment of the position. If, however, Mussolini had no decision to make, he had to take certain measures of precaution, and therefore Ciano would put the following question. The Führer had mentioned two conditions under which he would take Poland. One, if Poland were guilty of serious provocation, and two, if Poland did not make her political position clear. The first of these conditions depended on the decision of the Führer, and German reaction could follow it in a moment. The second condition required certain decisions as to time. Ciano therefore asked, what was the date by which Poland must have satisfied Germany about her political condition? He realized that this date depended upon climatic conditions. The Führer answered, that the decision of Poland must be made clear at the latest by the end of August. Since, however, the decisive part of our military operations against Poland could be carried out within a period of 14 days, and the final liquidation would need another four weeks, it could be finished at the end of September. I start that uh, sentence again. Uh, since, however, the decisive part of military operations against Poland it could be carried out within a period of 14 days and the final liquidation would need another four weeks, it could be finished at the end of September or the beginning of October. These could be regarded as the dates. It followed, therefore, that the last dates on which he could begin to take action was the end of August. Finally, the Führer assured Ciano that since his youth he had favoured German-Italian cooperation and that no other view was expressed in his books. He had always thought that Germany and Italy were naturally suited for collaboration since there were no conflicts of interest between them. He was personally fortunate to live 
at a time in which, apart from himself, there was one other statesman who could stand out, who would stand out great and unique in history. That he could be this man's friend was for him a matter of great personal satisfaction. And if the hour of common battle struck, he would be always found at the side of the Dutch. I think we might adjourn now for ten minutes. Let's do it up.